Welcome, and thank you for joining us for Who Me, Genio, a frank and hopefully fun conversation about Latinidad labels and identity. My name is Gladys Ramirez, Public Programs Manager, and your host for this evening. Join us in the chat on YouTube and Facebook. Let us know what you think, what questions you have for our panelists, and share your experiences with identity and Latinidad. This program is presented as part of the Norton's VISTA series, taking a look at people and cultures from Central America, South America, and the Caribbean through art, live programs, literary events, music, and more. The VISTA series is totally virtual and runs through October 12th. You can find the full schedule of events on our website. A special thanks to Art Bridges, whose generosity makes VISTA possible. And now, I'd like to welcome our guests for the evening. First, Rolando Chang Barrero is an American painter, filmmaker, performance artist, 2020 Muse Award winner for cultural leadership, and currently the president of the Palm Beach County Democratic Hispanic Chapter. Welcome. <laughs> How you doing? Great. <laughs> Thanks for joining that's us. A lot of intro. <laughs> Thank yeah. you so well, much. That's all you. <laughs> You're really, really successful. Um, Brenda Medina is a journalist who writes about racial and gender disparities, immigration, racism, and identity in the United States and Latin America. Welcome, Brenda. Hi. And Joelle Gaitan is a painter and ceramicist whose work studies matters of self identity, sexuality, cultura nicaragüense and ancestral lineage. Welcome, Joelle. Thank you. Thank you. How's everyone doing? <laughs> Yay, great. Thank you so much for joining us. And thank you, everyone, watching us live right now on YouTube and Facebook. So first, I'd like to set the stage for this conversation and for any of our viewers who might not be familiar with the term Latinidad. So that's a word that refers to the at attributes shared by Latin American people and their descendants as a way to address their cultural practices. While created as a unifying term, the idea of Latinidad has been rejected by many of those who, seek, who, who it seeks to describe for excluding indigenous, Afro, non-Christian, and non-Spanish speaking peoples. So Latinidad is one of those ways in which people from South America, Central America, and the Caribbean are identified in addition to Hispanic, Latino, Latina, and the most recent Latin X. I just want to jump right in with our panelists and ask, how do you identify? I'm going to go ahead and start with Rolando. <laughs> um, I, I identify as any of them. Uh, none of them insult me. Um, but when I, I do catch the air that someone is um, asking because of trying to place me in a pigeonhole, um, I always uh, let them know that I'm not going to allow them uh, to pigeonhole me. So I, in, in a humorous way, I tell them I'm Hispanic, I'm her panic, and I could be their panic uh, if they keep up that line of conversation. <laughs> if they know my name, and they could refer to me as my name. Uh, all in good humor, you know, uh, but make, standing my ground. Right. Okay. Right on. Uh, Brenda, how about you? How do you identify? Oh, I'm having trouble hearing Brenda. Can you hear yeah. me now? Okay. So it depends on how the question is asked. You know, sometimes people are like, where are you from? Or what are you? Oh yeah. The what uh, are you? I that always gets you. Yeah. yeah. And I usually say Dominican. But I, I see how that's easier for me because I'm an immigrant, right? I'm it's not like I'm not first or second generation. Um, I'm an immigrant, so I, I came from the Dominican Republic. But if I have to uh, fill out the census, for example, I was so happy to see this year. I don't remember if it was like that 10 years ago, but I was able to put my races. So I was able to mark black and, you know, Taino. And, and, uh, and that was easier because. Uh, before, I think it was only ethnicity, and I think is it doesn't encompass everything that you are, that right. I am. Right, so a lot of times in Latinidad, uh, we're, we don't feel representing, like we're rep representing people who might identify as Afro-Latino or from the African diaspora or Taino, which is an indigenous people. So, okay, good points. What about you, Joel? How do you identify? 
So as of now, I guess um, everyone just sees me in Latin, but I feel like the term is very, it's a comfort term because the term itself has a lot of deep value. For example, when Rolando said jokingly that they were hybrid, you know, I felt like, you know, it's, it's Latinidad is deeper than that. So it's comfortably Latinx, but throughout the years, you start realizing that that term is very exclusive. So as of now, Latinx for comfort reasons or to kind of dumb things down for people in a way. So for uh, their comfort, not your comfort. Yeah, because in reality, all of, like we're all like struggling, you know? So it's like, we, we, we're not Latinos or, you know, people usually just call us Spanish people, but, you know, technically Spanish people are from Spain. So it's kind of like a really big miscommunication. So um, it's, a, it's tough, comfortably Latinx, but in reality, it would be more like specifically from the region I come from, it would be mestizo because mestizo, you know, celebrates indigenous blood and Spanish blood. So comfortably Latinx, but I guess in like the reality, mestizo. I think you bring up such an interesting point, which is one of the reasons I wanted to have this conversation is that these identities or labels are often not for the people that they're mm -hmm. meant to describe. They're for other people's comfort or yep. their ease of recognition in terms of being able to put them in a box, right? So I think it's so interesting that you say, oh, I identify as this for them and as that for myself, which I think is part of the question, the part of the discussion, the part of what makes it interesting <laughs> because maybe not, maybe people uh, creating labels like Latin X to be inclusive, um, that was like such a, that was such a, hot button issue for me because I was like, who's this word for? Is this word for me? Am I Latinx? Am I supposed to be Latinx now? I don't know. What do you guys think about Latinx? Yes? No? Who's it for? How I, how I said it, it, to me, it doesn't make a difference if it's in, um, in good company. Um, and, and we're talking about self-identifying. And I think we all get to self-identify how we want. When someone approaches me with a choice, that's when that that's when I when I get a little sarcastic on them and and I remind them that that they don't get to choose how I identify. You know, like if they say, "Are you Latino now or Latinx?" They're giving me a choice, and uh, you know, just like with gender, when people ask me, "Are you gay, straight, or trans?" Uh, and what's your preferred pronoun? I'm like, Zare. And they go, what's that? And I was like, educate yourself. <laughs> <laughs> well, it does uh, feel like a, a, like a constantly evolving uh, cycle for yeah. people in the Latinidad, right? It's like yeah. one day it's okay to be Hispanic and then you have to be Latino and then you have to be Latinx and then, oh, well, but maybe you're Puerto Rican. Or, you know, it, it, it does become kind of like an interesting juxtaposition that we want to be who we identify, uh, but also like tick off some boxes. Mm -hmm. um, I, I like Latinx. I think it's more inclusive and that's important. Uh, I think there is a generation that probably won't understand it, but there is another generation that needs it. And I think it's important, especially for Spanish because Spanish is like such a binary language you have to be Dominicana or Dominicano, whereas in English you're Dominican, right? So, so I think the X helps there. And I think uh, I know some people are really ridiculing the um, the term, but I think there's this generation coming up that is more open about our ident different identities, right? The intersectionality that we have been talking about, and and it helps them and empowers them. But, it's still Joel is right, still a term that's very exclusive, but it gives people at least a little bit more options. Mm -hmm. Right. And so yeah, let me so, ask you, since you brought mm -hmm. up, sorry to interrupt Joel, no, no, uh, the, uh, if being from the Dominican and you're either Dominican in English or Dominicana, Dominicano, uh, do you feel that that is Latinx is something that is being embraced in all of these countries that make up the Latinidad or is it an American term? I think it's, a, it's an American term. Definitely. Yeah. Okay, Joel, I'm sorry. There's nothing wrong with that. You know, there's a huge community that, is, that has been 
group into this one umbrella that doesn't even refer to race or ethnicity, only to the place where we were born, right? Huh. So there is this culture here that other countries are not necessarily going to embrace us quickly, but it doesn't mean that it's not necessary where we live. Joel? So the term itself, like, I feel like it's, um, it's good, like Brenda said, that it's being in, in, inclusive because the term, you know, is finally like, okay, so Latin languages are very male dominated in a way. I, I wouldn't know how to say it. I think there's a term for it, but um, for example, when you say la silla, la puerta, it gives it the feminine. It's gendered, right. And then you put el sofá. So it's um, the language is very ge like gendered in a way because it's el y la. Um, so the term is is nice. It's it, it's also like a comfort term in my opinion. You know, it's cool because it you know it's finally you know recognizing trans folks that mm -hmm. hey I'm not Latino I'm not Latina but hey I do identify as Latinx. But at the end of the day, the term itself this it still ignores what makes up the whole Latinidad. Mm -hmm. You know, there's more than that. So it's cool. I mean, that's why I'm saying, like, right now we're we're like a, a work in progress. We're we're a work a work in progress. Is what we are right now because the term itself is, you know, like you know, Latina and Lat like it, all of us right now we say we're all Latinos. Why can't we say we're all Latinas? Right. So we're kind of like a work in progress because, you know, we're realizing that hey, this is this was great for a moment because it, you know we're we're changing it up, but we gotta go deeper than that. Right, so like we're, we're, really we're headed in the right order. direction. So headed the, in the right uh, direction, yeah. Rolando? <laughs> women, women have always been on target, you know? Right now, women have been introducing uh, the term intersectionality. Uh -huh. And intersectionality is not owned. It is, it is, it, it is who most of us are. Uh -huh. uh, because when you, you say that I'm Latino, my, it discounts, or Latinx, it discounts my mother's heritage. It also assumes that I'm a heteronormative person that lives in a heteronormative world. Um, and it's not so. Yes. Um, I, I, I present like this today. I could present uh, in any other way that I want to tomorrow. Um, and it's not necessarily for stage. Mm -hmm. If I'm doing a performance, uh, and I want to channel that character. I become that character. Uh, and you have TV experience, people have in performance. Uh, and I will walk around for the rest of the day in, in a skirt and, and in a football jersey. Uh, so it doesn't, it, it doesn't, intersectionality really is um, something to, to become the conversation. Because we're, I don't think any of us in in in, in here are strictly Latino. Um, I, so you're I, saying Latinx is opening it up. And it's, it, Latinx is is a step in the right direction, and uh, because it includes and it, it has an understanding of intersectionality. Okay, and just mm -hmm. if I can interrupt really quick, just for anybody watching may not be familiar with intersectionality. I want everyone to understand and be part of the conversation. So here is a definition I've cobbled together from people and sources smarter than I. Uh, the, the, it's the idea that there's an, the, there's an overlap of various social identities, so of, of race, of gender, sexuality, and class, and that overlap contributes to that person's specific type of, of experience in terms of systemic oppression or discrimination. Um, so while, for example, an older uh, Latin Latinx woman might have one experience and that's totally different in their lives as a, a young white man and um, using, uh, uh, acknowledging intersectionality has allowed us to uh, acknowledge the reasons people have different backgrounds because of their different or different experiences excuse me because of their different backgrounds so that's what we're talking about when we mean intersectionality and feel free to expand or correct me if i've said anything wrong uh panelists but um so you think that latin x uh is part of um a movement towards inclusivity in a way that the ideals of latinidad 
have not been seen as inclusive. Um, how does that come up? Uh, I want to ask Joelle, how does that come up in terms of language? So when we think of Latinidad, Latinos, Hispanics, we think of Spanish speakers. Is that always mm -hmm. true? Exactly. So, mm -hmm. you know, we're basically we're, we're called Spanish people. Like, you're like, oh, yeah, the Spanish people, Spanish town, Spanish this, Spanish that, Spanish food. But it could really be like, I'm going to go eat some Dominican food. Um, and, and somebody else would be like, yeah, I'm just going to go eat some Spanish food. But it's not Spanish food. It's Dominican food. Yeah. Dominican food, you know, like, for example, like, it's, it's deeper than that. Um, that's why language is very complicate, compli complicated. And it's like, um, I don't know. The term itself, Latinidad, identifies Latin people from Europe who gave birth to Romanian, Italian, French, Spanish, Portuguese, and we're just we just highlight one set of people, you know. Uh, and what about all the indigenous people of Central America, South America? My my parents are from Peru. There's Inc Incans. They speak Quechua, mm -hmm. which is yeah. totally different than Spanish. So what happens if you fall into the, that that Latin diaspora, but you're you're speaking Quechua, mm -hmm. and Spanish mm -hmm. happens to be your second language? Mm -hmm. So what, as is the what, case, yeah. So what's up now? You know, I think in this country we have a difficult time uh, because of its uh, monolingual roots um, and the concentration on what they call assimilation. That if it, um, maintaining your roots, maintaining your language, maintaining um, your sense of uh, bilingualness or being a polyglot is seen in a front to assimilation uh, many times. And I mean, we're, we've created laws where signs can't be bilingual that, you know, uh, we fight to have inclusivity. Even now with the, with the let's say the ballots uh, to include uh, information in Spanish and in Creole here in my area, because we have a lot of Spanish and Creole speakers. Um, you have to fight to do that, you know? Uh, and, it, and it's it, it's challenging. We're in historically in most European countries because they're surrounded by so many different countries that speak so many different. It's um, it's ordinary for somebody to speak two or three languages. Um, and in this country, it, it's seen as an affront. Uh, you know, it's kind I, of it's kind of strange, yeah. isn't it? When you do, uh, you know, if you're lucky enough to travel through Europe, you see that people around the world are. <laughs> speaking two yeah. languages and they can communicate to you in, in uh, English. And uh, it's it's really, I mean, here in South Florida, it's yeah. very common, but throughout the United States, it's not as common. Yeah. And it's it's very interesting in that it, instead of it being acknowledged as maybe a sign of intelligence or so like an ability to master two languages, you, sometimes it makes you feel a little like the other, right? And then that brings us to uh, something else um, that Joelle had mentioned in a previous conversation, I thought was really interesting, is the idea of nationality, right? So um, maybe uh, someone from Mexico now, that's called Mexico, they might identify with their indigenous roots um, and be uh, 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 embracing that culture rather than um, what we identify as their nationality now, which is Mexican. So is there anybody that wants to chime in here on those kinds of ideas? Yeah, so it's like when you identify from a country that you're from, what are you really identifying? Like, you know, you have Mexico, Guatemala. Those are two, those are two countries whose term, who, whatever the term, what, what the land was called, the region was called before Spanish colonizers. Um, but it's it's in a comfort it's a comfort term too because Mexican is in Spanish and you know and then you have like um, for example Guatemala has Nahua in the language you know and then so does but what about when you get to El Salvador El Salvador is Spanish Honduras Honduras is um, it was it got Honduras got the name from the colonizer when they came to the region of Honduras they said este país está muy hondo meaning like this this country is very deep so they named it honduras mm. so it's more like so what was the land what was the region i don't really i'm not a big fan of borders so what was that region called before somebody came over here and called it hondo mm -hmm. and you know so it's 
I don't know. You guys can chime in if you. <laughs> so and, you know, I'm, it's, I'm it so, seems like uh, people's nationality overtakes their native cultures, uh, their their indigenous roots in a lot of of places, yeah. and that and, we've we've shined a light on nationalities. But what about the people behind that place from exactly. before? And since we yeah. have a, a Dominican speaker like Brenda, you know, so like the island is called Isla de Hispaniola, which is in Spanish. Dominican Republic, uh, la, la República Dominicana, that's Spanish. But Haiti is, um, I think it's indigenous, I'm not sure if it's Taino related, but Haiti is actually Haiti, mm -hmm. which it kept is indigenous term. But right. the, the, the Dominican, um, the La República Dominicana, is so un nombre, you know, already Spanish. So yeah. it's kind of like, what, what what are we really calling? And then the island is called La Isla Española. So, you know, how are you going to come over here to an island and then call it a Spanish name? You know? Right. So that's a big when part the, of colonialism. The island does not, yeah, the island does not belong to the Spanish people. Let, let, Brenda, chime so in, I, please. Yes. Yeah, I pulled this study today that is very recent from last month from the Pew Research Center. And turns out that uh, they interview, uh, they polled Latinos or Hispanics or Latinx in, in the United States. And turns out that they found out that 50% of them, when they're asked about their identity, they prefer to use their national origin or their parents, even if they're second, third generation, they prefer to say um, Mexican or Dominican or Guatemalan. Um, and then 19% said they just want to be able to say I'm American <laughs> without the labels. And then the rest was felt comfortable using Latino, Latina, Hispanic, or Latinx. Uh, it was really interesting to see that I, I wasn't that crazy. 50% <laughs> of people, more than 50% of people and uh, do the same. Yeah, that rings true. I, I say I identify as Latina and I identify as American, but never at the same time. <laughs> Yeah. So it kind of like it's like my my two parallel roads of my personality. And that's interesting because sometimes, you know, um, you know, you just want to be like everybody else. Right. And then it's always mm -hmm. that sense of other. And sometimes it's great and it's fabulous. And then sometimes it's makes you feel a little outside of your element. So Brenda, Brenda, back, oh, sorry. Uh, no, no, it's OK. Brenda, like, let me see if you would happen to agree with me. But, you know, like, um, do people in like when for example when I go to Nicaragua people don't say I'm Latino they say I'm Nicaraguense so do, the same thing happened in DR cuando tú vas a, uh, a la República Dominicana la gente dice que do people say that they're Dominican or that they're Latinos you know I feel like is that a comfort term for the Americas or what's up yeah I mean it's, it's a term created in the United States right it, mm -hmm. I think Hispanic was created by, I believe, the Nixon administration to be able to group us in, mm -hmm. in the census. So it. it's a term created here to, to group this vast, you know, array of people that come from different race, racial backgrounds and different countries. And, and that's what makes it inherently complicated. Uh, so if you go to the Dominican Republic, people are Dominican. <laughs> if you go to Mexico, they're Mexican. It was very confusing for me and my sisters. We immigrated here as uh, teenagers in 2003. And when we saw those boxes, you know, in high school, uh, we were like, what is this? <laughs> what do we put? We like, oh, like, it's dangerous uh, mm -hmm. because it, it takes time to understand it, you know? And as, as um, as, a, as an investigative journalist, I understand the, the importance of it. Uh, maybe I believe it has to evolve and it has to give people more options, but it helps you quantify inequality. Like when I'm working on investigations and I want to see if people from a certain group are being discriminated against by the police, I have to go and see who they arrested. And those boxes are important because it's majority of the people who you're arresting Black or Hispanic. And even within Hispanics, then I have to break them down. Are they white Hispanics? Are they black Hispanics? Are they indigenous? What do they look like? Where do they live? What is their income bracket? You know, but I see the usefulness of the boxes in terms of like quantifying social issues. So, but when you go to, the, to Latin America, um, um, I think people just identify as their, their nationality. That's mm -hmm. so interesting, Brenda, to think about how useful it is. Um, 
and how important it is for journalism to keep track of those things. So while some of us may shy away from those labels, there are times when they're useful. Rolando. I, I was going to touch on journalism and I, I'm working, I, I, I wear like 10 hats because I'm a visual artist, I'm a performance artist, I run a gallery and I'm gay, all, the, all of these things, right? A lot of hats. So uh, what's, what irks me is when I get a call and they go like this, uh, the news wants to interview me because I'm the president of the Democratic Hispanic uh, chapter, right? And they go like this. So what's the pulse of the Hispanic community? And I'm like, I don't know. I haven't talked to Brenda and I haven't talked to Joel uh, or, or their community. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if they've assessed the, the different economic brackets from their country, <laughs> fellow countrymen that are living here. Uh, because we forget that Nicaragua, Dominican Republic, Cuba, Puerto Rico, all 20 uh, continental Latin American countries and all the Caribbean islands that are considered uh, Latino or Hispanic also have economic brackets, also have you know cultural uh, racial differences within their own countries. And all of these people have representation in Palm Beach County. Uh, so to assume that we're one one thinking block uh, or one political block is, it, and they and my problem is that they know that we're not. It, it's just lazy um, because they don't want to do that much research, mm -hmm. uh, and it's it's based on economics. We're we're important enough when they're trying to sell us something, and and they're we're the target audience for a product, mm -hmm. but when it comes to services. It seems that 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 those demographics and the, those uh, monies to research uh, what our needs are individually, um, they're better spent somewhere else. <laughs> and and that brings us to uh, a point. Thank you for for mentioning that. Yeah. Something that I wanted to bring up with uh, election madness all around us. I've been watching TV. I think as much as all of us around the world right now. And I hear these pollsters or, or campaign managers uh, talking about voter blocks, right? So these are uh, groups of voters that are seemingly motivated by common interests or concerns uh, to the point that it affects their votes. So yeah. uh, I, was, I'm, I was fascinated because, you know, I'm hearing things like NASCAR dads or white suburban women or Pennsylvania coal miners, and then the Latino vote. Like yeah. that, yeah. everybody else goes in this bucket. There's no like, you know, Cuban guys that like country music. It's like the Latino vote. Well, the Latino and vote, the, thing, the same thing goes on with the LGBT community. And when you say the black community, mm -hmm. which black community? It's big bucket. Which, yeah. which representative of, of the huge continent called Africa are you talking about? Or are you talking about descendants that are born here, but yes, descendants that were born here that only have this and this and this in common because a Southern black and a New York black is different. You know, and I always tell them, you know, even within our country, you know, um, you assume that Hispanics, let, let's go back to Hispanidad and Latinidad, that because we eat rice and beans and we may have rice and beans in common. It's a different type of rice and it's a different type of bean in almost every country. For sure. <laughs> you know? Oh, yeah. And they don't, they don't get it until I tell them. If you eat a hot dog in New York and you eat a hot dog in Chicago, it's still an American hot dog, but it's a completely different hot dog. Oh, for sure. <laughs> and they go like, oh, because they don't think that, that we are as diverse uh, within our own country as white mainstream culture is in this country. Mm -hmm. um, you're, because and we make the same mistake by saying white culture or American culture. Mm -hmm. um, and we, we have a, an acute understanding that they are very different because we know the difference between a white person in the Northeast, the California, a Texan, someone from the Midwest, um, they are acknowledged. Right. Even in polls, they, they're acknowledged. Right. Uh, but they don't, they, don't, they don't ever think that our countries are just as diverse. Mm 
and, and you know, yeah. people are just as diverse. It's it's a it's a it's a small umbrella, and a lot of us are crowded in there. So let me yeah. ask you, Brenda, as in your experience as a journalist, how does it serve or not serve quote unquote Latino voters to be put in a homogenous group? I think it doesn't serve, it mostly doesn't serve the campaigns and the political operatives and the parties that do this. Like I agree with Rolando, it's, it's lazy and it shows, it speaks volumes about the lack of diversity, both in the media informing people uh, and, and, um, and just boxing everyone in this Latino, the Latino vote, you know, uh, yeah. bucket. And it speaks volumes about who is working for your campaign, who is doing your legwork, how much and how well do they know the community. And it's, it's, it's a disservice to themselves because if you, if you were to like get organized and you were to actually get to know these communities, then you wouldn't be shocked when there are Latinos for Trump. Or, I mean, the shock right now is that the leader of this group called the Proud Boys is a Cuban guy who grew up in Little Havana. Mm -hmm. And it's like, like Rolando was saying, uh, we come from countries that have a very similar history of colonization and, uh, and racial inequalities and genocide and, you know, everything that we know of our history in the Americas is very similar. And so we are going to come here with the same backgrounds and the same social issues. And there are white supremacists in Latin America and there are people who espouse these ideas and they're not, I mean, people change, but they're not automatically going to change just because they come here, you know? Uh, and, and so now you see in all the media, there is this chug and I'm like, why? Like, do you not know the history of Latin America? Right. And it's very interesting because that's something that uh, a lot of people don't realize the issues of, of race, uh, racial injustice, systemic oppression, uh, these ideas of the other, um, of supremacy, racial supremacy. It's very prevalent uh, throughout Central America, South America, and the Caribbean. Um, I, I know, Brenda, something interesting that you were talking about is um, uh, Afro-Latina Dominican models um, and, and this idea of beauty. Could you uh, talk about that a little bit? Yeah, this is the story that I wrote a few years ago about this beautiful uh, young women from my country who are uh, becoming top models in you know, the fashion world internationally. But when I interview them, they're like tall black girls with curly hair. Uh, many of them come from like low income families. And um, all of them told me in their own country, they would never be in the cover of a magazine. They, they are not the standard of beauty. And it's, it's similar to here, you know, there is like a hierarchy of like beauty here too. And, and like we're, we're more advanced, <laughs> but uh, in the United States, I think um, in terms of like the diversity of an ideal of beauty. Uh, yeah, but in my country, they were never considered the standard of beauty. And then they go out and they build these careers as models because everybody just see how beautiful they are. <laughs> Wow, that's so interesting. And it makes you wonder, like, um, you know, is this a uniquely American problem? Or is this just a problem that we're in the middle of facing head on? Um, and I think a little part of that has to do with this, um, I know, um, uh, ideal of decolonization that's happening culturally and within the art world. And um, that I, this idea of going back to your roots, going back to um, where your lineage traces back to. And I know, Joelle, that's something that you do explore in your work. How, does, uh, how do the ideas of decolonization or your ancestral lineage, how does that influence your work and, and what you see going on around you now? I think we lost Joelle. Okay, well, we'll wait for him to pop back up. And I just want to give a quick shout out while we took a little break here. Thanks, Peggy. Thanks, Anthony. Thanks, Marta. Lots of comments from Marta. Really appreciate you guys joining on, on the conversation. And Ananda was super grateful to Brenda for uh, talking about 
clarification on the Latinos for Trump. She finally gets it. Hey, that's what we're here for. Okay, Joelle, welcome back. I, I, I was saying that I want you to talk a little bit about how your work is exploring the ideas of decolonization. Okay, um, you can hear me fine, right? I just had a little, yeah. okay, cool. That's okay. <laughs> Um, so yeah, the work specifically, I like to do pottery because pottery has always been here, you know, especially like before colonization, pottery specifically in Nicaragua has always been there. The language has not, language changes, but the pot in the end of the day, the pottery is still going to be there in the land, in the region. So the work that I do is um, kind of like getting back to the root because you know, whenever, um, if you guys correlate as well, whenever I go to, you know, like specifically when I travel to Nicaragua, art is done for survival when we could be here in the United States and we could do art for as modern art, as fine art. But what makes it different when this artist in Nicaragua does a beautiful pot for sale, for survival, and then I have the privilege of coming here to the United States making a beautiful pot for sale, and it's called fine art, it's called modern art, it's called folk art, you know, they could mm -hmm. call it everything and gives it value. But then, you know, in our countries there, you know, you buy stuff, but if you have like, like, like a piece from a country, I ask you, hey, who is the artist behind this work? Or, hey, which, what is, tell me more about this piece. You'll just tell me straight up, I got it in, in Nicaragua, I got it in Colombia, but who made it? When it comes to like here, I, hey, where'd you get this piece from? Oh, I got it from this artist who is from blah, blah, blah descent. That I could tell you more about that piece, but then when it, it, it's like, there's a difference between tourists. Right. Art, but man, so it's like, you know, as I do this work, I recognize my privilege as first generation. Mm -hmm. And um, it's just, a, my work identifies, you know, sexuality and identity and what it means to be, you know, where I'm from, because it's, it's so much more than just folkloric art, or what you want to call it, because that's literally I'm always thrown into that category, like folkloric art. Why can't I be modern art? Why can't I be fine art? Yeah. What makes something it's, fine art? What makes something folkloric? You know? Yeah, it's it's so interesting that you bring up this idea of of uh, contemporary art and art created in Latin America or Central America. That's considered Latin American art. Whereas if it's created now, it's still contemporary. It's just a geographic border that you're unwilling to cross. So I think, I, thank you for bringing that up. I always think it's really interesting when people see it as two different things, when contemporary art is just made now, right? And that idea of, you know, it, you could be the best artist in the world and you're selling your pottery or your paintings um, on the side of a tourist path and it's just like oh it's a souvenir but you're right there is that that element of privilege when here in the united states you're able to make a career and make a profession as an artist rolando what's your take on this um i i was born here you know i was educated in this country and i i, I went to school at a time when Ana Mendieta was doing performance work back in cuba uh, and it was a lot of performance art was being done uh, right before um, her unfortunate death. Mm -hmm. um, and Guillermo Gomez Peña was doing work on the border. Um, there, Jose Vedia was just uh, coming from Cuba back at that time. And, and all of these artists were, were dealing with th these exact issues. So these, all these issues are not new. Um, people have always wanted to look for their roots and, and to reduce it simply is that most work is autobiographical. Um, whatever Joel is doing, whatever Brenda is writing, it's what's interesting to her, what she's been assigned at any given place in time. It's where she's at and how she's digesting it and how she's writing about it, just like Joel. Just like me, I, I lived through the AIDS pandemic while I was studying. So a lot of my work is always seen as social justice because I look beyond the surface um, and it, it's influenced a lot by, by my understanding of a political nuance in my world, you know? Mm -hmm. And the history that I lived in was also written by white gay men. Mm -hmm. uh, 
not a Latino gay experience or black gay experience of a subculture that also died at the time and that we needed to record their reality. Um, and I'm, they asked me to participate in Cuban American shows, Latin shows, Latinidad uh, programs like this. Uh -huh. um, and I am probably the most Cuban uh, out of the group as far as language and culture. And because I eat Cuban food, I, I, I hablo como, como white. Como cubano. Uh -huh. <laughs> Uh, when I went to Cuba, they almost arrested me because they didn't believe that I was an, an American. Uh, so I, I comport myself, my, my, I present um, very much like a chameleon because I've been able to assimilate but never lose uh, my first culture, my first language. Yet I am... Um, I'm, I'm in a flux because I don't belong in the white world. I don't belong in the Cuban American world, the Cubans that are in this country, um, because they see me as, as a gay person. They see me and they associate all their prejudices and all their classes things towards me. And with the gay community, I'm also seen as the Latino gay. Mm -hmm. So it's always being a role of um, a, a minimal, a, a minimizing role, you know? Um, a chameleon. <laughs> and so, so you learn, like you say, when I'm, a, when I'm around my white friends, I, they wonder if I'm Italian or Jewish because I have no accent. <laughs> Pero cuando ando, cuando ando con los latinos, me dicen que se llama, oh, coño, eres cubano. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And that's so funny that you, you brought up a, a couple of points I just want to yeah. note really quick, is that uh, that idea of um, art being autobi autobi autobiographical. 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 This, yeah. is, this is recorded, so that will exist forever. It's autobiographical. Uh, and, and so as an artist, if you're, ref if you're reflecting your experience with, with uh, this is just a rhetorical question. If you're experiencing your uh, like racism or injustice or you know, uh, some sort of oppression and that comes out through your art and that's just a reflection of who you are and your experience, then you also get put into this, oh, well, this is social justice work. Oh, this is a political yeah. statement. When rather it's just an expression of, you know, if I lived, if I was Georgia O'Keeffe and I was in Santa Fe, you know, painting a flower, then that's not political because that's her experience. But if you're now you're growing up on the streets of New York and you have it rough as a kid, then that becomes something else. And the other thing that I, I really like that you were talking about is how you were. Uh, rejecting labels at the beginning of the conversation, but maybe that's part of why you feel like you're not uh, fitting in in some places. And that's yeah. how you uh, adjusted because I know I've experienced that where I, I want to reject labels after, you know, I have like an identity crisis, you know, like my Spanish isn't good enough for la some Latinos and, you know, I look to Hispanic for some white people and it causes like this kind of identity crisis sometimes of like, well, what am I? Am I what I think or am I what everyone else thinks I am? When they ask me to identify what type of work do I show at my gallery? Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, and I really want to just say I, 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 I show artwork. You know, <laughs> real artwork, but for uh, there for to contextualize it for easier digestion, I I always say a social justice gallery. Oh, okay. Uh, because I deal with living art. Uh, I I showcase performance art, musicians, and everything that are responding to life today, mm -hmm. and life today happens to be riddled with social justice work. So at least for these last four years that, I, that, that I've had the box gallery, it's been a social justice gallery. When I had the boutique gallery, it was a showroom. Right. <laughs> you know. Right. And oh, I just want to uh, really quickly get one more thing. 
Uh, one more thought out here from Brenda, and then I'm gonna shift gears. Uh, Brenda, I know some of your work has included um, uh, how art and race, or art and Latinos, um, how that works together. What are your thoughts on, um, as an outside perspective, obviously you're, you're a journalist, you're not part of this crazy art world. What, how do you think that all fits together? Oh, hold on. Can you yeah. hear me now? When you were talking about uh, whether you just want to express yourself and then you're labeled as political, I've also heard this, this phrase, uh, mm -hmm. all art is political. And I think it is. I think even that flower in Arizona is political. You know, I think when you put all of like the different art expressions in context and then you look at where they're who they're coming from, it says a lot about a community. I think right behind me I have this mm -hmm. the painting from the Harlem Renaissance, right? Uh and um I don't know if you just wanna look at that as a march of like black families. You know, you can take it at that, but it's, it's a very political painting. Uh, mm -hmm. The whole movement was very political because it's expressing what uh, a community is living at the time. Uh, and so I think we, we shouldn't, I mean, you are, <laughs> uh, I mean, people shouldn't shy away from it being political or being social is always going to be there's always someone who's going to put it in that context and identify with it and maybe it empowers them. And Fair enough, it. fair enough. Okay, I just wanna give a shout out. Peggy brings up the point, many white people she knows identify as a hyphenated term, right? So like Italian American, Irish American, um, and then we're getting uh, America, USA, it is what it is. All art is political agrees, Martha, thank you. So now we're getting close to the end of our time. I wanna switch gears a little bit and uh, guide us towards a little bit of trivia that I hope will spark some conversation in the chat amongst us and um, amongst our viewers at home. I'm, I'm gonna call it, what's in the name? So I wanna pull the curtain back and take a look at uh, someone who is uh, what I call a low key Latino. And, um, and also one of the most well-known stars in Hollywood and see maybe how, what's in a name? Um, so let's see. We can see, I'd like to introduce everybody to Ramon Gerard Antonio Esteves, who is professionally known as Martin Sheen. So Martin Sheen is best known for his leading role in Apocalypse Now and my favorite for playing President Bartlett in The West Wing and his sons, well-known celebrities themselves, Charlie Sheen, Emilio Estevez, uh, panel. Do you think Martin Sheen would have made it as a lead of Apocalypse Now? Would they have let him play the Ameri uh, the president of the United States of America if he went by his given name, Ramon Gerard Antonio Esteves? Well, of course not. It's the name <laughs> itself, and it's you know they're praising the the white name. Like if you say if you say his real name while he speaks, it's like oh he's so ethnic, oh he's so international. Like no, like. That's what you get now. Like, look at the movie Roma. Like the movie Roma, how you have the white Mexican family playing the rich family, and then you have the indigenous Mexican girl doing the cleaning up. Is mm. I'm tired of that. Like, when are we gonna get the indigenous girl to be, you know, a movie where it's just a movie? Mm -hmm. Stop highlighting like indigenous people have to be the cleaning people, and then the white Mexicans have to be the. I'm sorry, no, I'm getting out of topic, but it's <laughs> no, that's this. Hey, I brought it up. This is it, the topic. It, 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 it resonates, definitely, definitely, it resonates. yeah, definitely. He'll be like very, like, you know, oh wow, he's so he's so powerful, he's so Latin, da 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 da, you know, yeah. like, shut up, yeah, he'll, he'll be the, the, the jardinero. Uh, Rolando, you had a reaction too, uh, yeah, no, I mean, um, uh, no, it, he wouldn't have made it. Um, Rita Hayworth wouldn't have made it into the movie, she wouldn't have become a starlet. Um, her, her her name is actually Margarita Carmen Casino. Uh, okay, keep going. Sorry. And, and, and you know, it, there's a whole bunch of people uh, throughout in, in theater, uh, primarily. We remember uh, Que Pasa USA. Love that show, yeah. Y que Rivia Chavarria, and then he, everybody kind of like lost. They Because he was good looking, they forgave him. 
But suddenly he changed from Ricky Echevarria to Stephen Bauer. And he went into international stardom. Right. Um, but everybody was Perfect. like, oh, that's Ricky. Yeah. So uh, Brenda <laughs> is representation. Up recent oh, history. It, it, it's up until recent history. Um, and that, that still exists even in the art world. Up until oh. 1989. The uh, Museum of Contemporary Art in Chicago hadn't shown a woman. Wow, 1989? Yeah, 88, 89 was when they first uh, they gave a woman a solo show. Um, so, you know, it, 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 is, it is, you know, when um, the Black Lives Matter movement brings up a good uh, word, systemic, that has always existed, but now it's a lot of people are, uh, it's become a household word which is systemic right. racism. And instead of challenging each other and defending ourselves, we need to look at, at that term uh, with an air of uh, building and unifying the community. Um, because if we, and you know, a friend of mine always says, if you can't name it, you can't tame it, and you can't change it. Oh, um, wow, that's a good way of putting it. And these terms, um, you know, people get, get um, defensive about, you know, like if I say um, that's a racist thing to say, they think I'm calling them racist and I'm not, I'm correcting their language. Right. You know, when people- now, White say, fragility. Like for white fragility, white fragility, I empathize with people, uh, with, my, with my friends that are white because they end up getting very defensive and, and yes, they, they have been attacked for a long time by a lot of people. Um, and they, but they're not at fault that they have white privilege. It's, it's right. a state of being, it is historically set in race, racial terms and that's where its history comes from. But it's not them specifically. It's not their fault that they walk on, on this earth without certain fears of being discriminated against or being stopped by the police. It's not their fault. But it's unless, a privilege. Unless, yeah. we, unless we have a conversation that, that other people do not have that privilege. Right, and let me let me go to uh, Brenda. Uh, what do you think, uh, as a person who's wor who works in media, um, is is representation important for Latinos, Hispanics, Latinx people? Oh, there we go. Try, let's try again. You mean representation in the media, or how the media portrayed this community? Yeah. Yeah, Both. yeah. As Joel was saying, you know, we see them all. We have the 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 housekeeper, the gardener, or the sex pot, right? Those are our visions. And if you're in the chat, tell us what do you think when you think Latino, Latina? Who do you think of? Who who is that? Leave it in the chat. We'll look at it in a second. Brenda, I think it's extremely important. I think it is something that should have been done decades ago. You know, it um, it helps or harms how we are seen in the greater, you know, people imaginary and um and yeah, we're not doing a very good job. We're not giving people nuance. Uh we're not affording them nuance, right? Uh mm -hmm. you you I think it's a problem of the lack of diversity in these spaces. Uh if you don't have a, a diverse workforce, if you don't have diverse uh, directors, casting, you know, people, if you don't have diverse journalists, you're only going to have one point of view. And that point of view is always going to be biased. And it's all, it's limited to what the people you have in your team see, right? Um, and I, I saw a comment about how the uh, Univision and Telemundo portrayed the Latino community. And, you know, it goes back to who is the decision maker, right? Uh, what is the diversity in this in these two companies? Uh, do you assume that they're gonna be full of Afro Latinos or uh, indigenous people just because they're Univision and Telemundo? They're very white, like the rest mm -hmm. of the media in the United States, and and it comes through in the you yeah. know and the work that they present. And it's the same for newspapers. It's the same for public radio you know the, all these conversations are happening now but they should have you know been happening 50 years ago 
Right. Yep. And I, I hope that it's changing a little. Like, I love Rick and Morty. My favorite part, for those of you that watch Rick and Morty, my favorite part is that Rick's name is Rick Sanchez. And you never hear a Latino reference in that show, which I think it's fabulous because he's just like allowed to exist. So a little bit more of trivia. Joel, were you about to say something? Yeah, I'm, I'm just backing up on Brenda. Like, it's just, you know, diversifying. But then also when people do diversity, they kind of mimic Black and Latino people. <laughs> so look at the 70s shows. They probably thought they were so cool because they were doing diversifying with that guy that... But all they were doing was making fun of him, making a heavy accent, and he's doing all these things and saying things in Spanish, like, oh, you guys are so political. But you're being mimicked. Right. You're being ridiculed. It's ridiculed. Right. It, yeah, it, it is what it is. It's like, oh, yeah, we're, we're, we're very, you know, modern. You know, we're, we're hiring Black <laughs> and Latinx actors, but right. you know, we're just making fun of them. Yeah. And I think the chat agrees. Everyone's saying, no, no, no. Martin Sheen would never made it if he had stayed Ramon. So uh, good on him for knowing his audience. And uh, uh, yeah, uh, one more little tidbit is also um, Raquel Welsh. She is, uh, her father is Mexican, Joe Raquel Tejada. Interesting, cause you know, mm -hmm. she's internationally known, uh, a sex symbol, very successful um, actor and you know, low key Latina. Um, so and Linda Ronstadt. Is she? Linda Ronstadt is uh, a, a Spanish singer who was very well known, very popular. And then when she came, they wanted to break her into the American uh, market. They gave her a couple of uh, cover songs from Buddy Holly and from the Eagles. And everybody thought she was an American country singer or Southern singer. Uh, and she's Mexican. Wow. <laughs> and, she's uh, and she's got one of the most beautiful uh, Latin American voices that and she didn't disappear. She didn't, you know, die. She didn't do it. She just went back to her country and continued to record. It. And she's the superstar that she deserves to be because of the wonderful, gifted voice she has. Wow, that's, that's an interesting piece of trivia. See, I'm glad that sparked some conversation. Also, that, we're short on time, but, you know, it's also like it's a shame because even like, like, you know, we have our first generations. First generations are not claiming who they are. They just. You, they, you know, I get it. We're in this point of survival in surviving in America, but people don't even care about knowing how to communicate with your parents in Spanish. Spanish does not belong to us because Spanish is from Europe, but it is a form of communication within our parents, unfortunately, because that's the language that was given to us in a very happy way. So it's like, you know, we can't even, we don't, we don't follow those traditions. After, mm -hmm. after we're done here in this world, that's mm -hmm. it. What's going to happen after that? What about that? You brought, you brought up an interesting point. Um, uh, Dr. Uh, Raul Ferreira Balanquet, who's a performance artist, mm -hmm. that has been dealing a lot of with the decolonization issues and, and Latinx issues. I invited him to do a performance for the, uh, I, 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 every, every year between Christmas and New Year's, I have the black and white affair at my gallery. And he did a traditional, uh, decolonialized mm -hmm. Afro Cuban dance, and he was mimicking the sounds and channeling the sounds that were that he studied in language. And a lot of the Cubans came to see it because it, it, it is rooted in Santeria, but they were expecting the Santeria that was the hybrid that they recognized from their country not the traditional African sounds and, and garb and, and movement. Probably and they have the they right walk, they, most of most of all of these Miami Cubans <laughs> and to see the show, they took off running, saying that it was that that you know that, that was like a, a voodoo thing that, that you know and it's like because somebody celebrates pre Columbian or pre colonial the aesthetics and dance and language movement, um, they're threatened by it because that means that they have to rethink what they believe in. Yeah, it depends how you do it though as well because if you look at El Carnaval from Barranquilla, Colombia, yeah. they do blackface. 
they, yeah. they paint themselves in all black and they mimic and they do all these stereotypes and all this stuff. And, and people, you know, love El Carnaval. Who doesn't love a mm-hmm. carnival? But mm-hmm. you're, how are you doing it? Like, especially the art world, you think you're so cool because you're, you're putting a spotlight on something. But yeah. how are you doing? Are you being racially insensitive? Because you're literally doing blackface and mimicking and yeah. doing all these dances that don't even belong to you. Like, yeah. for example, you say um, they were doing, you know, Santeria-based, you know, performance that belongs to Yoruba people. So why don't you stop hiring white Cubans and hire black Cubans? Who are yeah, just- no, no, Raul Ferreira Balanque traced his own roots. Mm-hmm. This is, he went back and he's he's been, he's got a doctor. I, uh, I went to school when he was my senior and he helped me edit my first couple of films that I released and he has been working with all of these issues of finding himself and where his his, his he originated from um, mm-hmm. before he his family appropriated all the colonialist views and the hybrid and the synchronization of Catholicism yeah. with uh, Yoruba religion and the syncretism that goes on there and the watering down of the essence of, of their religion and their language. And he's been able to trace down phonetically the sounds and everything of where his, his ancestry comes from. Uh, and that's not something that you find on uh, ancestry.com. <laughs> <laughs> and I... Yes, Brenda, last thought. I'm, I'm, we're coming up against the clock here. Yeah, cool. when Joel talks about the that practice in, in Carnaval, at least in my country, you know, a lot of people painting themselves black are black. So it's a little different, you know, than, than like putting on black face. I think it makes a difference and I would be very disturbed by, you know, white people coming and, and appropriating that practice. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and well, and... That leaves us on a note that I wanted to bring up a lot of questions, a lot of controversy, a lot of different perspectives. And like I said, Latinidad is an umbrella and there's a lot of people packed in here. Sometimes it gets a little crowded. Thank you so much. I I thank everybody for their thoughtful comments in the chat that were going off. And thank you so much for joining us. Uh, Rolando, Brenda, Joelle, I appreciate your time so much. Thank you. Thank you for having us, Gladys. And that's it for tonight's program. Thank you so much for joining us. To see the full schedule of events for our virtual Vista series, please visit Norton.org. And while you're there, please consider making a donation to support programs like this. A special thanks again to Art Bridges for their support, and thanks to you, the audience, for supporting our programs presented in a new way. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you again soon.